Welcome. My name is Casey Tonnelly of Beyond Think, an anti-racist coaching and facilitation practice. In collaboration with Karima Edwards of Hummingbird Community Cooperative, we've teamed up to work with the P-Patch team to strategize and think about ways to foster greater inclusion in the P-Patch garden community. One of the ways that we're doing that is we've created a learning library. This library has been informed by the BIPOC Affinity Space, a new space that's going to be created for BIPOC gardeners to come together, collect a new space that's going to come together so that BIPOC gardeners can come together, connect, share experiences, build community, and feel in solidarity with the experiences they've been having both in life and in the garden. Some of the other exciting videos that'll be a part of this library are cultivating a greater sense of community, also known as playground rules. What is BIPOC affinity space? For folks who, who maybe have not heard of this before, we'll have a video available for that. What is it? Who's it for? And why it's really important. We're going to have a video on dimensions of diversity. This is going to walk us through if there's a lot of different dimensions of diversity and it's impossible for us to understand every single dimension or have a connection to every single dimension. So it's really important to understand what they are, what are yours, how your lens was shaped, as well as what does it look like to communicate and connect across those different dimensions. We'll also have calling in versus calling out. There have been some behaviors in the gardens that folks just haven't known how to interact or strategize or interrupt when they happen. So we'll offer a video that supports both calling in and calling out as well as bystander intervention. These tools and videos that we're going to share with you will hopefully create a greater sense of community and inclusion within the gardens, as well as support you as communicating and connecting across difference in your lives as well. Another video that we'll be sharing with you is the value of intergenerational work. This is very, very important as we have a lot of gardeners across the different generations and spectrum of age. So that's a little bit about the learning library. I hope you peruse and find value. Uh, many of the videos will also have it resources and handouts for you to partake in as well. So hopefully the learning can continue beyond the videos. But to kick us off, I had the privilege of connecting with Nate Moxley from the Pea Patch community, and he's going to walk us through what the anti-racist policies are within the Pea Patch program, why they were created, the value they bring, and why they are important. Welcome, Nate. So excited to have you here with us, and thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be covering the new anti-racist policies within Pea Patch, which actually are not that new. They've been in place for a little bit, and I appreciate you taking some time to share with us uh, what they are, why they're in place, and why they're important. I think sometimes when new policies can get created, it's a real opportunity for confusion to get to happen, as well as there's a potential for misinformation to get out there. So really appreciate you taking some time to help us all be a little bit more clear on what the policies are, why they're in place, and why they're important. So thank you so much, Nate. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. So let's just jump right in. What are the anti-racist policies in P Patch? So specifically, the priority placement guideline looks at prioritizing underrepresented groups within the P Patch program. With that, the groups are youth and senior groups, low-income folks, and people of color in general. Um, all in all, the priority placement guidelines, and it's something that we will continue to do moving forward. One of the other policies I'll speak to is related to the staffing. So each of the community garden coordinators were asked to prioritize BIPOC groups within their gardens, within their communities. So for each of us, that's looked different. I'd say some of the other stuff that we have done in regards to our anti-racism work is the rollout of our anti-discrimination policy. And that has allowed us to put language around uh, no tolerance for discrimination, um, getting ahead of the issues. One of the things that we rolled out after, after that incident um, in the garden is is steps for folks to take prior to calling the police, prior to approaching people, and sort of giving giving them a, some questions to ask themselves before taking any action. Hey, thank you so much for, for answering it so comprehensively and really tying a number of things together. I really appreciate uh, you also talking about all the different dimensions of diversity that are included in the prioritization, right? And when you're working with young folks or, or elders or and focusing on folks of color, they're not always three separate groups, right? There, there's a level of intersectionality that can happen as well. And so I really appreciate being able to hear a little bit more about who we're talking about when, when we're really 
focusing on the priority placement program. I appreciate how PPATCH is investing time, resources, tools, tapping into other city resources in order to create a greater sense of psychological safety and belonging among gardeners. And, you know, and that piece of like, with all of those investments that are being provided, where are our responsibilities? Where does our responsibility lie? Because it is going to take everybody. It is going to be up to everybody to, to help to foster and create and cultivate that sense of inclusion and belonging. And so I appreciate that you named that because I do view it as an invitation to lean in, to try new things, maybe struggle, and really to foster the kind of community that, that everybody feels that they belong and that they can thrive in that space. That's wonderful. One more question about, you know, you, you referenced how this the city and PPATCH program in particular has been, you know, trying things out and implementing things over the over the years. And so, so tell me a little bit of why did these new policies get created? Yeah, I think one is there's this perception of the PPATCH program being a program that is primarily white women over the age of 50, as sort of the primary, the prototypical PPATCH gardener. And while there probably are quite a few, the reality is, is that it's always been a fairly diverse program. We've always had uh, Southeast Asian and East African groups very well represented within the program, or it's been sort of the way in which we've, we've worked primarily with those groups who uh, a deeper look at sort of the number if you will. And I think that was one of the big reasons why we wanted to roll out the priority placement um, program because certain groups were underrepresented. And because of that, we knew we had to do more. And the priority placement policy and, and rollout allowed us to do that pretty directly. Yeah, Nate, thank you so much for sharing all of that additional context. I think context is one of those things that can really help folks get clear on why things are in place. The other thing that I really just wanted to highlight, a couple of things that you said, is that who has access to even participate or potentially participate in the peat patch program. And, you know, I think a lot of times we have a tendency to look at like the moment versus kind of historically looking back and like over the time periods, right? And so it's wonderful that there has been such high representation from Southeast Asian folks. And with information of like, well, our Black and African American community members haven't had as much participation, right? So I think there's this piece of like, what we're always doing in this work is evaluating, is looking, is examining, and also looking past as well as at the present in order to build the future. And so I really appreciate you adding that in uh, because I think sometimes it can get a little unclear when folks are like, well, we have diversity. Yes, but we don't have all. And, and we have folks who are still left out. And so making sure that with that information, how do we create not only pathways, but the invitation that folks can trust to enter. I'm really, really appreciating that. One of the things that I love about having a very diverse garden is also the variety of things that can get planted and learning new techniques. There's opportunity in adding diversity into gardens too. It's, you know, there adds this exposure of multicultural food options, multicultural garden techniques, multicultural ways of engagement. And so uh, the richness that can come from that is unbelievable. And this is not a garden an example, but there have been studies that show when teams, and they're mostly referring to workplaces, but they can apply to community too. When there are more diverse lenses engaged, less challenges arise, more creative solutions get created, and the opportunity to actually explore like what potential, you know, struggles or obstacles could get in the way, everyone's bringing different lenses, so more gets illuminated. And the richness that can come from the connection, the productivity, the engagement, and the health, right? People feel a greater sense of not just belonging, but of overall health uh, when they get to feel that they're valued, that they're heard, that their experience is important. And I feel like all of the whys that you just shared are really, really illuminating and highlighting the power and the richness that comes from expanding and deepening the level of not just diversity, but the understanding of inclusion and belonging as well. Well said. So our final question that we're going to tackle today, and this is a little bit more personal, Nate, so I appreciate whatever level of sharing you're willing to offer us today. Why are these policies and creating a greater sense of inclusion and belonging important to you? You know, great question. And I'll start by, by speaking to my own connection to gardening, to nature in general, and the recognition of the importance of that. You know, Black folks in particular 
used to represent a much larger percentage of farmers, for instance, in this country. You know, racist policies within the USDA and the loan programs, black folks now represent like 2% of all farmers. So that's one level of it. I mean, the farming side is, is one thing. It isn't something that the pea patch program is obviously necessarily involved with, but we're supportive of and, and recognize the history of farming in this country. But the thing about it is, is that it's, I believe it's impacted how black people in general feel about gardening. And that's not to say that black people don't like gardening. No, that's quite the opposite is true. I think that there's some stigma in some groups, but there's a lost connection. And I think for a lot of the younger generation, the 40 and under will say, there's this desire to reconnect to the land. And so for me personally, anything that I can do to help black people and in, in any person of color who wants to reconnect to the land, that's important to me. That's deep because so much goodness comes from digging in the dirt, uh, planting a seed, uh, eating food that you've grown from seed that, you know, any opportunity to be involved at any level of that process of reconnecting folks to this opportunity to reconnect uh, for me is is just it's the deeper level of soul work it is part of why i'm here part of part of my life's work and that's the primary why you know i think there are other elements to it as well some of the work that we're doing is while not directly involved for instance like the black farmers coalition work to put young black farmers on land for instance this idea that the urban ag sites are about engaging education and that these groups are now looking to establish themselves on larger tracts of land that is really important work and so that's another part of the sort of the why I think that this this is important again getting back to the why I think that that I'm um, seeing the, the bigger picture in terms of what's happening seeing that this is the way to food sovereignty one of the pathways to food sovereignty is growing food at scale that can have an impact that puts black farmers uh, on the map is super important. Yeah, Nate, thank you so much for sharing all of that. One of the things that I was like really sitting with as you were talking was talking so much when you were talking about some of the, the historic policies that were either implemented or put in place to remove Black folks from, from farming, from agriculture, and like really thinking about like the connected dot. So those are historic practices and laws that have present day manifestations. Right, the present day manifestation of that is exclusion. And so looking at the work that's happening, where it's like, how do we create, recreate new openings, new invitations to like bring folks in. And I loved how you were talking about the experiences of folks of like getting to be able to like be in the dirt and put their hands in it and like rip stuff out and how that is also helping folks connect to the land and their own humanity. Uh, reconnecting with your own humanity is a pretty big endeavor, especially these days. And also this idea of like creating spaces for healing as well is so important when you, when you think about the hundreds of years of harm that folks are experiencing. How much healing time does that take? Like, and what does healing even look like? Mm. And, and, and who gets to be a part of it and just loving the idea of it's everyone's responsibility and opportunity to help create these spaces of inclusion and belonging where folks can reconnect to the earth and to themselves and be welcomed and embraced in ways like what are the seeds of possibility that we get to create um, within the pea patch garden that then are connected to a greater network and i appreciate you sharing so much about that extended network of like folks who are both connected to the gardens but also doing in, in other areas too and how it's all connected because I think that that's one of the things that we it's hard to see when we look at a large national scale it's easy to be like mm, not bad mm, that's not so good and it's much harder when we're in it and it's yeah. personal and it's right in front of our faces but but this is such an opportunity for everyone to lean in to be open to the ideas of how can you contribute to these seeds of possibility and as you mentioned to that intergenerational work i'm comfortably middle-aged now and which is a gift but i also think half of my work now is how do i support young folks coming up i used to work with youth speaks uh when i used to run this all ages poetry slam and they had a, say, a saying that was like when the youth speaks the truth speaks mm -hmm. and that. I really believe it. You know, I always think as somebody who's no longer a uh, part of my responsibility is being like, okay, I hear you. Uh, I don't know that. I got to learn about it. Like I'm going to need to educate myself on some things, but how do I, how do I use like my, my opportunity, my privilege, my power to help create the pathway for you? And, and, you know, and, and while I still also have plenty to learn from my elders. 
lives, right? And mm. so looking at how the conversations need to be intergenerational, the work needs to be intergenerational. And something I think about too, Nate, is I brought up those historic laws and practices. I think about our ancestors, right? Like our collective ancestors and what labor and emotional labor as well as physical labor did they have to engage in to even create the opportunities for us to have this conversation? And how do we honor them? Are we honoring their labor, their work, their sacrifices when we're showing up to these conversations. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your knowledge and wisdom and the grace that you're offering and sharing with us. And you've created a whole myriad of thoughts for me to go down. So I really appreciate that as well. Thank you so much, Nate. Any final words you want to share with folks? I didn't mention one group, but I want to add them into the mix. And that's the great work of the nurturing roots. You've got gathering roots mm -hmm. that I mentioned out in Auburn, and you've got another group, nurturing roots. Great work happening there. They were Beacon Hill based group and now out at the Red Barn Ranch in Auburn. Another black led uh, group that is doing amazing work, engaging youth, growing food for their community and looking to expand their impact by that move out, out to Auburn. And I think that's extremely important. Um, one of the other pieces that I'll mention is our desire to work more closely with um, indigenous groups, in particular the Duwamish tribe. They have been making inroads in terms of their indigenous gardening efforts and creating these healing gardens and that's something that we are looking to do a better job of elevating and partnering with um, the tribe and so we've been in talks and are going to be working with them uh, hopefully in the next year creating some indigenous gardens within our own ski patch site helping them with their work to do that and sort of in conjunction or next to the longhouse that's another part of this work that we're looking to expand as again our connection to the indigenous community mm. Oh, Nate, I appreciate you bringing in. Um, it's also a way of honoring the land that we're on, yeah. right? And, yeah, and, I, and I, I love that idea of one of the practices that to include is that well, if we're going to honor this land, like including the indigenous folks uh, whose land this is, is such a good part. But the other thing that I think you're bringing in is that the work continues, the work expands, the work deepens. It's never a one and done. And so this idea, and it evolves, right? And so I love that even as y'all are inviting gardeners to participate in this experience of creating a greater sense of inclusion and belonging, that work is also continuing to, to expand that as well. And so I love that there's also this both end to it. It's both an invitation for folks to join you, but also a call to yourselves to kind of engage in it as well. And just that acknowledgement of the work doesn't end, the work continues, the work expands, it deepens, and we're stronger when we do it together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Casey. I really appreciate your style and the way you sort of synthesize everything and brought it together. Well done. Yeah, thanks, Nate. I really appreciate your time. So I am so honored and grateful that I got to have a little bit of time with Nate Moxley uh, from the Pea Patch Program, who helped to kind of highlight why are these policies in place? What are the policies and, and why it's really important? I hope that you continue to check out the videos in the Learning Library and that you continue to do your own work as well as connect with other gardeners who are also leaning in to trying to to create a greater sense of inclusion and of belonging. My name is Casey Tonnelly of Beyond Thinking, and I thank you so much for your time. If you would like to reach out to Karima or myself, you can see that our emails are up on the screen. Uh, but mostly, please engage, please keep watching, and thank you for your time, your energy, your labor, and your investment.